Hey, welcome back everybody to part two of this four-part series on bacterial virulence, the ability of bacteria to cause disease and the actual molecules and structures involved in causing that disease. In part one, we talked about opportunistic versus acquired pathogens. We talked about hospital acquired and community acquired pathogens. What we want to do now is we want to answer the question, why we feel sick? That's a question I get all the time. Well, why do I actually feel sick? What causes the signs and the symptoms of an infection in my body. So we'll briefly touch on that. And then we're going to look at three categories that are all related of virulence factors. Adhesion factors that allow bacteria to adhere to tissue. Spreading factors that allow them to invade more deeply. And digestive enzymes that allow them to feed on your tissues. So let's first ask this question or address this question, why do we feel sick? The actual feeling of being sick, uh, and we all know what that feels like in various contexts stems from a, a combination a really of two different things. One is direct cellular damage. Bacteria actually um, attack our bodies physically and break down our tissue. So sometimes you might have local discomfort or pain. Um, sometimes it might be systemic. Uh, sometimes they're going to be killing cells directly or interrupting cellular function such as with toxins. Um, and we'll talk about toxins here coming up shortly in uh, the next video. Um, and <clears throat> remember when cells get damaged, cells make up tissues. Tissues make up organs and organs make up organ systems. And so when the cells of, let's say, the lining of the digestive tract are being ruptured by maybe a salmonella infection, the entire digestive tract is going to feel the ripple effects of that. So there's direct cellular damage. And then there's also the immune response. A lot of what we feel with an infection, whether it's bacterial or viral or otherwise, is due to your immune system attempting to protect you. And we'll talk later in the semester, there's a later set of videos on the adaptive immune system um, and also the innate immune system. And there are a variety of chemicals that collectively we call cytokines that are involved in coordinating and communicating the overall immune response. And those cytokines, we have good evidence, make us feel really crummy. So a lot of what you feel with an infection, a lot of that blah and yuck and ache, is due to those cytokines. And so when you feel them, just let yourself remember, oh yeah, that's not directly because of the pathogen. In this case, it's because my body is fighting the pathogen and it's using some pretty heavy-duty warfare to do that. So these, these cytokines can also cause inflammation. Inflammation can be uncomfortable. It can be painful. It can cause pain and tenderness uh, locally. It can cause fever. Uh, malaise is that just general blah, yucky, you want to curl up on the couch and close your eyes kind of feeling. Um, the cytokines can cause headaches. Uh, inflammation can lead to rash, it can cause uh, nausea and vomiting or diarrheas, your body attempts to get the, the microorganism out of the gut, for example. But why we feel sick, the answer to that is, is typically some combination of direct cellular damage and the immune response to the infection. So let's think about that direct cellular damage. Let's think about what happens when a microbe gets in the human body and establishes an infection. What actually allows it to cause that infection. Well, one of the first things any microorganism, and we're going to focus on the bacteria, but any microbe needs to do is actually adhere to the specific tissues that it's capable of infecting, right? So a um, great example might be in the world of viruses. If, if you've got a, a hepatitis virus that has the ability to infect liver cells. If that hepatitis virus is on your skin, it's not likely to cause infection. It needs to actually physically interact with the tissue it's going to infect and attach to it. We sometimes call this specific adhesion. And that specific adhesion can be mediated by a variety of things we generically call adhesins or molecules, structures, virulence factors that allow for adhesion. So some common adhesins might be fimbriae. We talked about those way earlier in the semester. Uh, so there's a, a much earlier video on, on fimbriae. Uh, pili, which are most commonly associated with the sex pili, the conjugation pili of, uh, of F plasmids, but they are also involved in specific adhesion. Turns out that flagella are often good adhesins. Many bacteria use their flagella to attach very specifically to a tissue. So these are cell surface appendages 
mostly protein, sometimes polysaccharide, sometimes a glycoprotein, which is a combination of protein and polysaccharide. Another really important category to think about would be just simply proteins, very specific adhesin proteins on the surface of the pathogen. So an example would be Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea is one of the very few um, cocci that are gram negative. So this is a gram negative diplococcus like this. It has on its surface a protein called OPA. And OPA has a very high affinity for a um, molecule called CD66. And CD66 is a protein that is found in high abundance on the surface of human epithelial cells. And therefore, right, if these OPA proteins have a strong affinity for the CD66 proteins, then these these Neisseria gonorrhea diplococci will have a very easy time attaching to specifically human epithelial cells. Now CD66 is in higher abundance in the urogenital tract and so Neisseria gonorrhea which causes gonorrhea more often is likely to attach to those CD66 um, proteins and those epithelial cells. But it turns out there's some also in the upper respiratory tract. So for example, you could have a gonorrhea infection of the upper respiratory tract. It's not as likely because there's less CD66. So there can be some highly specific proteins on the surface of a pathogen that act as adhesins in addition to these more common categories we think of like fimbriae, flagella, and pili. Now another really important adhesin or um, potential adhesion virulence factor would be a capsule. We talked earlier in the semester so you can go back and you can find an earlier video on capsules. Capsules are made of a material called EPS, extracellular polymeric substance. These are typically going to be polysaccharides but they can also be protein in some cases. Here's Streptococcus mutans, common in the human mouth, and they're uh, stained negatively so that we can actually see the capsular polysaccharides surrounding the streptococci in this case. These capsular polysaccharides allow them to form biofilms on our teeth, and that's what you're scrubbing off when you're brushing your teeth. You're getting rid of tartar, which is biofilm that's still in a gooey, sticky state. Uh, when it becomes um, calcified it's a lot older biofilm and it's a lot harder to get off um, but when it's still in this softer state we can scrub it off and physically remove it and it's we have to physically remove it because these sticky uh, capsules have allowed them to form biofilms you can find an earlier video on both biofilms and capsules and brush up on uh, on your details but it's once they've been able to establish these biofilms that they start fermenting and they're homolactic fermenters which means no matter what food they eat they secrete lactic acid that lactic acid etches away at the enamel and causes a dental carry or a cavity so specific adhesion very very important and there's some important virulence factors associated with it now spreading factors sometimes called invasins are uh, proteins usually enzymes that allow some bacteria to invade more deeply into human tissue all right, and have access more deeply. Now these are, uh, some of them are less common. Kinases are relatively common. Kinases break down blood clots. So for example, staphylokinase produced by Staph aureus. The immune system tries to clot in the staphylokinase so that it doesn't spread. Uh, if Staph aureus is, can, is carrying a staphylokinase enzyme, it can break that clot and spread a little bit further. Streptokinases are very common with group A strep or streptococcus pyogenes and they allow group A strep to be more invasive. So anytime our immune system tries to clot them in and contain them, they can break free with their streptokinase. In fact, streptokinase is so good at breaking down these blood clots that we can use purified streptokinase to inject into some people's arteries to break down their blood clots. So kinase is very important spreading factors. Uh, hyaluronidases and collagenases break down connective tissues hyaluronic acid and collagen respectively. These are less common fortunately and when they do show up we tend to have highly invasive infections. So what you see on the right here is someone with gangrene. That gangrene is uh, infection of so gangrene is infection of living of, of dead tissue on a living person. So in this case this person had frostbite that completely killed which means irreversibly damaged the tissues. 
and soil organisms like Clostridium are able to get in there. They have endospores, they revegetate because there's no oxygen, because there's no blood flow, and they can, if they carry a high aluronidase or a collagenase, can begin degrading all of that tissue and essentially feeding on that tissue. Gas gangrene, maybe you've heard of, is when the fermentation of that tissue, the infection is so aggressive that you can actually see bubbles in the tissue forming um, as byproducts from the fermentation. So for example, some Clostridium species, uh, like perfringens, which is very likely what's infecting this tissue here, can carry collagenase. Some strains of group A strep will have hyaluronidase, not all of them by any means. Some strains of Staph aureus can carry hyaluronidase, again, far less common than, uh, than not. Neuraminidases are interesting because you can see them both in viruses and in bacteria. So for example, influenza carries neuraminidase. Neuraminidase is an enzyme that breaks down all the various polysaccharide fibers in the extracellular matrix that surrounds the intestinal epithelial cells and kind of helps to hold those intestinal epithelial cells together. Uh, in the case of, and because, I'll say this because I mentioned influenza, in the case of influenza, they're going to be breaking down um, the extracellular matrix molecules found in the lower respiratory tract. In the case of Vibrio cholerae or Shigella dysenteriae, these two organisms cause severe dysentery, sometimes even deadly diarrhea, um, and it's largely due to the neuraminidase breaking down the actual epithelium of the intestinal tract using neuraminidase. So these are spreading factors. And then finally, we've got to keep in mind from a bacterial perspective, they're not infecting you out of like spite or anger or hate or some weird anthropomorphized idea here. They're simply feeding on you, right, which is bad enough. And one way for them to feed on you is to secrete enzymes that degrade your macromolecules, right? If you remember the four major macromolecules, nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, all great energy food sources for bacteria. So some bacteria carry nucleases to break down RNA and DNA as a food source. Some carry proteases to break down proteins, lipases to break down lipids, or carbohydrate active enzymes to break down various polysaccharides and release all the sugars. In the process, they can do a lot of tissue damage if they have these tissue digestive enzymes. Okay, let's hit the highlights. What do you need to take home from this? Number one, signs and symptoms of infection are, are typically caused by a combination of direct cellular damage and the immune response. Adhesion factors, adhesion is very important in the process of infection, and adhesion factors include things like fimbriae, pili, flagella, capsules, and some specific adhesion proteins that some bacteria produce. Spreading factors or invasins that allow bacteria to dig deeper into your tissues and feed more deeply on you include kinases that break down blood clots, hyaluronidase and collagenase that break apart connective tissues, and neuraminidases that break apart the extracellular matrix, especially when it comes to bacteria, especially lining the intestinal tract. And then finally, tissue digestive enzymes include nucleases, proteases, lipases, and carbohydrate active enzymes.